Hey, good morning, welcome. Chris here. Today I'm going to talk about uh, something a little more grim, I suppose. Uh, and it's called the widow's tax trap. You may or may not have heard of it. Um, I hadn't heard of it until just this past year. Um, so I was completely unaware of it. And it relates to how the tax status is, the tax, your tax status will change uh, as you become a widow. So if you, you know, you, I think the standard plan for myself, and probably a common plan for married couples, is that you, um, you, know, you live your life together, you retire together, and then you know, the reality is one of the spouse will die, leaving the other to carry on. Um, and that's kind of a tragic story overall, but at the moment where that happens, uh, some pretty significant uh, tax consequences arise um, out of uh, a couple of things happening. One, that uh, after a two-year grace period, uh, one of the spouses will be left filing in a different tax uh, bracket, which has uh, fairly significant tax consequences. You will lose a deduction. And also, depending on whether how you have planned for your retirement, if you have tax-deferred uh, retirement accounts, whether they be individual retirement accounts, uh, 401ks or 403bs, uh, you will be paying taxes on those, and you'll be having to take uh, distributions against those, whether you like it or not. Their required minimum distributions are generally part of the plan for many of these uh, retirement accounts, targeted retirement accounts. And so you'll want to pay attention to that f for yourself and your spouse. So what I'm going to walk you through on screen is how, how a very basic, uh, very basic income stream, um, a, a retirement account um, a situation will work for a couple um, entering their retirement years and then one of them uh, dying uh, you know, a dying. And so the spreadsheet will, will kind of highlight how this works, show you what some of the tax consequences are. It's certainly not end of the world type stuff, but they can be significant for uh, the remaining, the, the surviving spouse. So I hope this is useful. I'd love to hear comments, uh, thoughts, or concerns down in the comments section. Here we have a basic table in the spreadsheet of income and taxes for a married couple. And so in the model here, we're looking to demonstrate how the widow's tax trap works. So I'm going to walk through each column briefly. We have column one, which is spouse one's age, uh, starting at age 65. We have spouse two, two years behind, starting at age 63. I've got a couple of kind of semi-hidden columns here that represent three different income streams. And then I've got the monthly income total here which you can see changes a little bit over time. This column is the annual income, which is simply monthly income times 12. We have the standard deductions, which I'm basing it 100% on the year 2020, which uh, gives you a married, married couple filing jointly uh, 24,800 in deductions, uh, a single person 12,400 in deductions. We have a taxable income column, which is simply annual income minus the deductions. We have a filing status, which is jointly and then changes to single. We have an IRA, which is an individual retirement account column, which represents all of their individual retirement account holdings, whether it's one count or multiple accounts, and whether it's this person or that person. I compressed it all into a single column just to demonstrate. We have this column called RMD, which stands for Required Minimum Distributions. Required Minimum Distributions are amounts that you are required to take out of your individual retirement accounts, whether they're 401k, uh, 403b, or IRAs, um, and we'll look at a chart of how that works. Here's your taxes that you're going to pay out of your taxable income. This is your effective tax rate after, it is, after tax, which we'll look at over here in these columns, are applied to your taxable income. And then here's your, here's your after-tax income, which is essentially your take-home pay. Now, if we look at the RMD column real quickly, the RMD is calculated. It is this number divided by another number, and that another number is de dependent upon your age. So we're going to look at this required minimum distribution chart for, I just looked up at Smart Asset. So at age 62, which is now what the SECURE Act uh, allows you to, at age 72, that is when your required minimum distributions must begin. 
And so it, you will take your total account balance and divide it by 25.6 when you're 72 years old. And so in our chart here, we see spouse one is 72, so they begin to take their RMDs. They take 914,000. They divide it by 25.6 and it gives them 35,000. So that 35,000 is taxable at ordinary income. So once we start receiving them, that amount is added over to the taxable income column as well. So that's, uh, that's how that works. Now, when we look at our model is here to demonstrate how the widow's tax trap can, can, uh, can penalize uh, widowers specifically. And so in our model, we have spouse one uh, dies at age 74 which statistically is a little bit earlier than normal, but that's okay. Um, it does help make the waddle worse, and, and people do die at and before age 74, so it's not completely unheard of. But for reference purposes, the average man in the United States dies at age 78, just to give you a sense of what the average is. But our model here, the, the spouse one will die at age 74. We'll be talking about the consequences for spouse two after that happens. So they're, talk a little bit about their monthly income. It's comprised of three columns, which I've collapsed just to get out of the way and make a little bit of space. Um, and and I, I'm treating Social Security just like any other income stream, although the way that you are taxed for Social Security is different and unique. It is special. And there's some calculations that are going to go into it that are more complex and will definitely require their own videos. In fact, um, I've watched videos from Devin Carroll and Josh Scanlon, uh, both on YouTube and have great videos on how to calculate your social security payments because it's it's not not a super complicated equation but it's it's a and it's an equation with conditions depending on if your money's coming from here or from there it depends so I simply applied the tax bracket rates to this amount I did not get into the details of breaking this out and in fact I think the reality is that you can only pay up to 85 percent of your social security amount so right out of the gate we're going to tax you at a little bit higher rate a little bit, but because I'm doing it before and after um, spouse one dies, I figure it's it's all the same, right? So the math will work uh, against us in both scenarios. So you might pay a little less overall, but the reality is the, the widower is going to pay more regardless. So I wanted to demonstrate that we have um, a pension income. Like well, I should I should talk through that quickly. You have pension income. So spouse one earns a pension up until they die, and when they die, their survivor benefit, survivor benefit for that pension drops it down to 600. So the widower will continue to pick up $600 in payment, but not the $3,500 they were picking up while spouse one was alive. Social Security, spouse one is taking a $1,500 benefit payment at age 65 and 66. Spouse two picks up the same payment at age 65, these are both averages. So I, I researched the average that a, a person brings in Social Security in the United States. It was 1,500. I, I researched what the average uh, a couple brings home in a Social Security pension. It was this. So I just used averages that were published uh, from Social Security themselves. And then in the year that spouse one, the difference. I say, well, half the year they're going to be pulling in this, and the other half they'll be pulling in that. So that's how you get to the 19. 1920 in the year that spouse one dies. And then the final income stream was that they had rental property that they maintain, and so they're pulling in $2,000 a month, and that just may, that, that persists throughout this whole model. So that's an extra $2,000. Not dealing with the cost of running a business or anything like that. We'll just say that that's the income that they gain from that. So that's how this works. Now, what we're going to do, uh, let me work through the rest of the column. I think. Uh, We've seen we have uh, taxable income is simply their annual income minus their deductions. Once they begin to get their required minimum distributions, that amount falls into their taxable income column. They are filing jointly until, until the husband dies. And the IRS rules have a waiver or a provision for widowers that for two years after the, de the death of their spouse, they can file, continue to file jointly and also continue to get the two deductions on their taxes for two years. So that is a benefit uh, that the widow will enjoy from a tax perspective for two years. Uh, beyond the two years, they will file singly, and that will, that will change their tax liabilities, and we're going to look at that. Uh, so let's begin. So, as you can see, you know, when they're married in their 60s and filing, uh, 
their, their effective tax rate, which is simply uh, this divided by this, uh, is 11.34 percent. And it stays that way through most of their uh, 60s and early 70s. It changes a little bit because spouse two begins to pick up some Social Security, which increases their, uh, their monthly income, but not substantially. Their after-tax after income is that you can see them moving between the low 50s to the early 60s in income. Primarily here, it's because of Social Security. Uh, in this year, it jumps up significantly by 30000 a year because of the required minimum distributions out of their retirement account, right? And that itself jumps them up um, about two and a half, between two and a half and three percent on their taxes, just having to receive RMDs. So RMDs is something that you want to be aware of, even if you're not considering the widow's tax trap. So they fall into a little bit of a higher tax bracket for a number of years, and you can see that over in their tax chart as well, where uh, for most of their retirement years, they're filing in the, within the 10 and 12 percent. You can see these uh, these marginal tax rates. The way it works is that uh, for the first $19,400 that you make, you are taxed at a 10% rate. Any, any income between $19,400 and $78,950 is taxed at 12%, and so that's what these numbers are. And then we just add these numbers together to get the total taxes, and then again, we divide this by this to get, we divide taxes by taxable income to get the effective tax rate. So. Um, this is how you know what you're paying in taxes actually. But once they start picking up the minimum distribution uh, out of their account, you notice that their income jumps up to over 100,000, which exceeds this $78,000 upper limit on the 12% bracket, pushing some of their income up into the 22% bracket. So that's what's happening here. They've, they're, they're incurring additional tax liability because they're, pull, they're having to pull money out of their retirement accounts. And this is all by design, right? It's, um, you know, the federal government gives you a break. They say, you don't have to pay taxes now if you put money in this account, but you will pay taxes later. And this is what it looks like. So this is how it is until spouse one dies. Spouse one dies, a couple things happen. The income drops. As you can see, the mo monthly income drops from 7400 down to 4100 primarily because there's a loss in the pension benefit, and also there's a reduction in the Social Security uh, payments that are made. Their income stream from rental stays the same in this model. So spouse two is still pulling in $4,100 a month and is also pulling in the required minimum distributions on their retirement accounts and, 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 and kind of reset the clock for themselves when the spouse dies. So we, at this point you'd reflect back to that RMD and this time you would apply spouse two. You'd say okay, so spouse two has the same thing, it's 25.6 for the first year. And so that's how we calculate this number. We take this number divided by 25.6, and that gives us 36,000. The next year when the spouse, is, spouse two is 73, we go back to the chart and we look for 73. This time it's 24.7. So we run the math, 24.7, which we have right up here, and that gives us 38,000. So you can see the, the RMDs are actually getting bigger, and that's because a couple things are happening. One, that this, uh, what will be the denominator, is getting smaller in the equation, but then also they're earning 5%, which is causing their retirement accounts to continue to grow, which is always a good thing. And so they're going to be taking out more in their required minimum distributions, whether they need it or not. And that's going to introduce tax liability, whether they like it or not. So in the first two years after the death of spouse one, which happens here, you can see that... Uh, Spouse two benefits from a jointly filing status and also gets that second standard deduction, which keeps the tax rates pretty low. Uh, they've lost some income, so their effective tax rate kind of drops back down. But in the third year, when they're, they have to file singly and lose a standard deduction, you can see that, you know, they're, and they're pulling in the, the requirement of distribution still, the effective tax rate goes up considerably. And that's due to the fact that we're changing tax brackets. So we look over here at this tax bracket which is for single single filers. Now, it's it's a little bit different. You you pay 10% tax on the first $9,700 that you make. You pay 12% on the difference between 9,700 and 39,475. You'll pay 10% on that amount. And then anything be, be a, beyond 39,475, you're going to pay 22%, which is 10% more than we'd seen before. 
And in fact, as spouse two gets older, they will make enough income that they're going to fall into the 24% bracket when uh, they make more than $84,000, which happens here, right? And actually continues to happen. So they're starting to pick up some tax liability in that 24% bracket, which is going to, you know, it's just more tax dollars. As you can see, uh, the last year that they were before their RMDs, they were paying just under eight thousand as a as a married couple filing jointly. And then uh, when spouse two approaches the age of eighty-two and filing, they're paying six over sixteen thousand, which is more than twice what they were paying before. There is a ten-year, at least a ten-year stretch between these two points in time, but it, it's significant. And so you've got an eleven percent tax rate. 11.4% tax rate here. As soon as you start to file singly, you jump up to 16.7, which is uh, more than a 5% increase in your tax rate, which is certainly not the end of the world, but it, it does equal dollars, right? So the difference between uh, filing a just under an $8,000 tax payment versus uh, just over a $13,000 tax payment, it's considerable. It's more than $6,000, and it gets a little bit bigger uh, the older you get, the, the larger this account grows. If you don't have a massive uh, individual retirement account or some other tax deferred account, your your problem may not be as big. And so in, in, in light of that, there's a couple of things that you can do to gear yourself towards that. So uh, an individual retirement account is an account that's uh, it's tax deferred, meaning you're going to pay taxes at a future date. But oftentimes, what will what you'll see some couples do is begin to move, especially when they're in their 60s here, and they're not they're not really being they're not into the 22% tax bracket yet. In fact, they still have a little bit of a gap, right? The difference between 78,000 and 59,000 is almost $20,000. So. Um, what you call a, a, a Roth conversion strategy can be implemented where you would move $20,000 a year from your IRA into a Roth IRA. You'd pay the 12% tax rate on that $20,000, but you would do that for how many years do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you could move $140,000 over and paying a 12% tax rate on that uh, and reduce this amount by you know, what did I say, $140,000. So it's just going to reduce the amount of taxes that you're going to, or the amount that you're going to have to manually, or not manually, mandatorily withdraw from your uh, IRA through these required minimum distributions. And with a Roth, you can take the money out whenever you like, and there is no tax consequence to it once you've done the conversion. Once the money's into a Roth IRA account, you can take the money out at will. Uh, you do not have to pay taxes on it. So there's a Roth conversion strategy that you can look at. Additionally, you can consider uh, diversifying out of your IRA or 401k or 403b and begin to invest more into, and oftentimes you may not have a choice with your 401k or your 403b, but I think you will have some choice as to how much you want to invest. You can begin to put money into a straight brokerage account, right, where you're buying mutual funds, ETFs or stocks or bonds directly. Um, and the, the gains, the income that you'll pull out of that will be taxed at um, capital gains tax rates, which tend to be, can be much lower, well not much lower, but you can be, be, be paying 10 to 15% versus the 22 and the 24% that you're going to pay under those higher bracket, ordinary income bracket uh, brackets. So it's something to, something to consider. Now if you yourself are in this position, or you're planning for your own retirement, or you have loved ones or friends that are looking at entering this period of life and they, they have done a good job of saving, they've got, uh, done a good job of loading assets into their retirement accounts, um, you may just want to ask them if they've ever heard of the widow's tax trap. Um, and, and you know, it's certainly, uh, it's not something, it, it shouldn't be something that few people feel attacked by, but it is simply something that may occur in their lives and hopefully we all get to a point where we retire and unfortunately, you know, spouses, one will usually die before the other. so. For most of us, we will face this situation one way or the other. And what we want to do is make sure that we are thoughtful uh, and we do a good job planning 
um, for whatever it is we want the outcome to be. And if you if you prefer that you want to pay taxes because you feel like that's your duty, that is 100%. Uh, that is a personal decision and it's not even necessarily a bad decision. Just be aware that this will be the outcome that you'll be facing and, and take measures accordingly. So that's it. Uh, that's, uh, that's a walk through the, the basics of the widow's trap and widow's tax trap and uh, what it looks like, how it can impact you or friends or family, loved ones that you may have that are uh, entering their own retirement period. Uh, thanks for checking it out and uh, we'll see you next time.